emphasize the old, uh, to come all the way from Owen Sound to have a talk to you people. Sid Dun Dunning, sorry, Sid's heritage was decided by fate. His grandfather was in World War I, his father was in World War II, Sid became active in the military, first as a cadet, then as a soldier, and finally back to cadets. Sid joined the Royal Canadian Engineer Apprentice Training Squadron with me in September 1956, or thereabouts. After graduating from this two-year arduous program, Sid was employed in numerous places. I wasn't. He was. He was everywhere from Egypt to the USA and back two or three times. <clears throat> Sid was also awarded the Silver Jubilee Medal to go with all the other Jubilee Medals that he was awarded. I have no idea how many medals this man has, but I know he has the Order of Military Merit to go along with it. And I can also tell you that due to to some ill health, he's not able to wear, wear them all at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> Sid retired after 40 years of active service. That's a whole lot, believe me. I, I, I did a whole 25, and that's all I could do. Uh, <clears throat> he's very active in the cadet movement, and God knows how many other uh, military ventures. Uh, and he's been a, a student of military history, probably from the day he could learn how to read. About 18, I think it was. <laughs> <laughs> Sid is, uh, has been to numerous uh, war cemeteries. He's traveled all over. He's read every book, probably. And... Uh, He's, he's just connected to the whole bit about war, and, and Canada, by the way. He's, he's an authority on Canadian military history. Their, their son and grandson are also both active in the military, so the tradi tradition continues. Uh, before I, I end this off, I just wanted to say hello to Flight Sergeant Arnold Grain. You notice I used the Flight Sergeant? Uh, and to Able Seaman Bill Hike. Nice to see you too. I'm sorry I don't know other military people here, uh, or I'd say their rank too. I won't say Sid's because he won't let me. <laughs> anyway, with, it takes, uh, er, without further ado, it takes great pleasure for me to introduce my buddy, my friend, Sid Dunning. <laughs> Yeah. You might notice he's very military. Let's get this thing going. Maybe you can wait a on temporary hold here. I can move the screen a bit. No, Gary, don't. Get it up for us. You ready? You see you ready? How much do you need? How's that? Is that okay? Beautiful. I know. You can see the best card you see. Uh, we'll let, uh, as they work on getting that going, I'll just carry on the interest of uh, time and brevity. Don, thanks very much for your, your kind words, and thanks for inviting me here tonight. I have an interest in Canada's military history, as uh, Don mentioned. Uh, I've visited Normandy several times, both on uh, duty and uh, on my own. Most, of, most recently, actually, I visited with uh, Normandy with Don. Um, and you see some of the pictures if we get that going on there. Uh, as Don mentioned, I've visited many war graves uh, cemeteries, uh, including uh, many of those of, uh, of Canada. Now, those of you who are Puritans realize there's only two Canadian cemeteries in Normandy, but they're Canadians buried in many cemeteries. Uh, those of uh, Great Britain, France, Belgium, South Africa, and Germany, and you'll see examples on, on there as we go through. 
We even found a third division uh, DD Memorial in the New Forest in southern England, and that uh, where they had some ceremonies on uh, as D Day was kicking off. Uh, my dad and several relatives fought in uh, uh, both wars, as Don mentioned. I've read a lot of books on the, uh, the subject, and I've served alongside veterans from both World War II and Korea. Um, when, when visiting those cemeteries, one quickly realizes the great sacrifices that uh, Canadians made. I was never able to go into one of those cemeteries, walk all through it, come out with a dry eye. The sacrifice uh, and their accomplishments is, is uh, uh, truly admirable. Tonight, with the help of Don, I'm going to tell you a story. And uh, this is a story of Canadians winning battles in World War I against improbable odds, uh, odds where other forces simply could not get it done. And we're going to carry on to World War II, where Desperate men jumped into the own unknown on D-Day, while others stormed some uh, very well-defended uh, beaches. This is a story that quite simply says Canadians never quit. The stories never get old in the telling, and I'm going to talk to you about World War I's, World War II's, uh, World War II, I should say, some veterans, as well as some units and organizations. You can understand, I hope, with all of that on the, uh, on the agenda, I'll be glossing over things fairly quickly. For example, we'll talk about the 1st Canadian Para Battalion, perhaps the Devil's Brigade, and more. Uh, regrettably, time will not allow me to talk about the early days and uh, the battle for Italy, uh, Africa, Hong Kong, the liberation of Holland, Korea, and everything since then in the UN uh, sorties, Afghanistan, and uh, uh, areas like Sudan, where our son uh, spent six months not too long ago. The World War conflicts of, uh, may have ended many years ago, but the Lakefield community and other Canadians, and four other Canadians, the wars remain ever present. Bere bereavement for and remembrance of this has never ceased here. We're a constant reminder of the, uh, re uh, the cost and impact of the uh, First and Second War lives with us. I highly recommend that all Canadians uh, visit the Bibby Memorial, uh, the uh, uh, Men and Gates at Ypres. The, uh, at, at, at the Men and Gates every day, the, uh, the last post is played, bugles are sounded, briefs are laid, the passages are read at 8 p.m. every night, 365 days a year. I recommend you go see the 4,000 Canadians at Tyne Cot Cemetery. While you're there, you, re you remember that uh, there are another 11,000 of their friends were wounded. See, the uh, 2,000 are honored in uh, nearby St. Julian. They were felled by gas attack. And everyone should go to see the Essex Farm Cemetery in West Flanders, where John McRae wrote in Flanders Fields. And his medical buildings are still, still there. You'll see pictures on there, I hope. John McRae, believe it or not, was fell from Guelph, and he used to, when he wasn't operating, playing medical doctor, he'd walk up on the hill and direct artillery. I always thought that was kind of an interesting fact about uh, that gentleman. You can walk down the road and you can still see the trenches. They're there exactly as they were in many of the uh, things that were uh, artifacts left over. So as I, as I said, as I talk, there will be a loop of photographs showing all the sites. Unfortunately, I'll be uh, talking you know, and time will not allow me to go into the photographs in detail. So in World War I, in essence, the memory is the pillar of our identity. In some circles, there remains the notion that a Canadian nation was born in Bimby Ridge during the First War. When we put on that Canadian uniform, How do we the things happened. The Canada of today How was shaped the through the experiences of the past. Bimmy Rich came to symbolize uh, Canada's First World War experience, triumph over adversity, but sacrifice an enduring legacy. 11,285 names are on that monument, monument representing all those Canadians killed whose final resting place was at least then unknown. More than 7,000 other Canadians are buried in 30 war cemeteries within a 20-kilometer radius of the Vimy Memorial. 
And if you go there and visit, I highly recommend you go down the road a little ways and you see the monument of the brooding soldier. The brooding soldier was, in fact, when they did the competition, which ended up in the success of the Bimmy Memorial, stood number two, but it was so beautiful, they built it anyway. Canadians and Newfoundlanders fought mainly under British command um, until Bibby Ridge. Newfoundland suffered terrible casualties at beaumont Hamel on the 1st of July 1916 at the first of the Battle of the Somme. Canadians, you may recall, experienced chlorine gas at the second Battle of Ypres, or Ypres as some like to pronounce it, in April of 1915. Only the Canadians held and did not retreat. The British lost 57,550 on the first Battle of the Somme on 1 July. And on 15 September 1916, of course, Canada suffered 24,029 casualties, but would fight on and become known as ace shock troops. Canadians never quit. In December of 1916, the Canadian Corps moved close to Vimy and began operating as an army. It was a proud moment for Canada. Finally, on 9 April uh, 1917, Easter Sunday, Canada got to fight as an army, did what the French and British armies had not been able to do. They fought as four divisions, as an army, and took Vimy Ridge under Lieutenant General uh, Lord Bing. He would be, later be uh, Governor General. The planning credits go to General Sir Arthur Curry, who was responsible for planning, execution, and a successful assault uh, he also remained vocal afterwards and was successful in arguing the retention of the Canadians as a single coherent fighting force. And by the way, a statue today, a statue is being erected near his home of Napperton, we now call it Strathroy, Ontario. Canadians prove that preparedness pays off, let all the troops know what is happening. So at Vemi Ridge, on 9th of April, on the 9th of April, 1917, till that point, unheard planning, where most, the most junior soldier was rehearsed and brought into the plan. Easter Sunday at 5.30, 30,000 Canadians bounded out of their trenches and tunnels under a huge artillery bombardment and achieved a nation-building victory. Many have said Canada's became, Canada became a nation that day. Our guys did the unbelievable, and by 0625 hours had captured the black line. Uh, by, 07, uh, by 0700, they had secured the second objective. They had the red line by 1100. On 10 April, they had secured Hill 135. The cost, 10,602 Canadian casualties, of which 3,598 died. Even today, we still have, because due to political nonsense, have difficulty getting a fight under Canadian command. But when we do, we are most effective, and only then does the world know that we took part. Later in World War I, Canada will fight in other battles, including the Second Battle of Passchendaele, 26 October to 10 November 1917, suffering a further 15,654 casualties. Finally, the Canadians would drive the Germans out in the Battle of Cambrai on October 11, 1918. In World War I, Canada lost 64,976 killed. Canadians never quit. Later, General Curry would attack and take Mons, finishing the war where the British started in 1914. Now think about that. Four years, and we're back to the start point. He and American General Pershing would say that they should have pushed the Germans right back to Berlin and they destroyed the German army then and there, or they'd have to do it again in 20 years. I thought I'd throw in one last point about that. The last person to die, the last Canadian to die, and I believe the last person to die in World <coughs> War I, was Private George Lawrence Price. According to one historian, and there are a couple of different slants on this, uh, Private uh, Price rose just briefly, and I like this part of the story, to greet the wave of a young woman he spotted above. And at 10.58 a.m., two minutes before armistice was finally 
I signed officially. It was signed at 11 a.m. November 11, 1918. The 25-year-old farm laborer was shot in the right chest by a German sniper near the Belgian city of Mons. Now, the only difference I've heard in that story is that he went out on the same patrol, but uh, and he was shot through the heart. But the sniper got him uh, while he was clearing a building. But anyway, so I'm not quite sure what the real story is. It doesn't matter. It's a state of the same thing. He should never have died. Don, I wonder at this point, would you talk about private uh, uh, coons? Please and thank you. A few years back, like on the 23rd of August, 1892, in the town of Apsley, Ontario, two boys were born. At the same time, I might add, they were twins. Uh, the, the one was called Thomas Coons, and that's Coons with the N-E-S, and his brother John. Uh, Thomas uh, joined the military in Peterborough on the 18th of March. No. 1916, with the 57th Regiment, 93rd Battalion, CES. That's called the Canadian Expeditionary Force. He had no prior service. Uh, his brother John joined in December that same year. On the 9th of April, which Sid was just talking about, the huge pushed by the Canadians. I'll, I'll, blame the, <coughs> I'll blame the drugs I had in the operation. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, unfortunately, Thomas was killed on the 9th of April, 1917. He's 25 years old. Unlike a lot of people killed at Vimy, they found uh, Thomas and he is buried in a cemetery. I'm not sure you understand or realize it, but the other 11,000 and whatever people on that uh, Vimy Memorial were never found. <coughs> Excuse me. They were never found. They're somewhere in France. Thank you. The. Uh Private Coombs is, uh, is interred at Nine Elms Military Cemetery, which is, uh, it was, the cemetery was begun right after uh, Easter Sunday, 1917. Uh, it, it's located just north of Arras and uh, about a kilometer uh, off the main road between Arras and Lens. I'm going to move ahead to World War II, and uh, to set the stage a little bit, I want to read uh, a little bit. Um, about the Dieppe Raid. The, the, the Dieppe Raid was to uh, gather intelligence and uh, reassure the Soviets of the intent of the United States of America and the United Kingdom. And I think it's important that we understand that. It occurred on the 19th of August, 1942. I was, I was over there recently for the, uh, one of the big anniversaries. Uh, the Dieppe Raid is, uh, had been a, a debacle. 907 officers and men died on the beaches. 586 suffered wounds. 1,946 became prisoners of war. Only 2,200 returned to Britain, many of them never having gone ashore. The Royal and Royal Canadian Air Forces provided air cover, suffering heavy losses, as did the Royal Navy. One company of the RHLI had been raised from workers in the E.D. Smith Jam Company at Winona, Ontario. It lost every man. A devastating blow to a tiny town. The Padre of the Essex Scottish left behind a camp and walked through the barracks, weeping at the empty beds. And in Canada, when the casualty lists were pro uh, printed, the shock was intense. The second Canadian division shattered took a long time to rebuild, regain its confidence, and General Roberts, largely, largely blameless, became the scapegoat. All right. The reason I mention that is because what I'm going to talk about here in Normandy 
of the eight Canadian divisions that you might want to discuss, we're really going to talk about the third Canadian division. They were aug augmented above by the second, who were still rebounding from the, uh, that, that particular thing at the end. And of course, the 4th Canadian Armored Division played a role there too. So in World War II, the first commander was Lieutenant General A.G.L. Andy McNaughton, and he was replaced later in 1944 by General H.D.G. Harry Crear. The Second War has been characterized as the Good War, or the Good Fight, or the Last Just War. So these characterizations, characterizations trivialize the hardships it caused. At the grassroots, among a lot of losses and mourning, celebrations of victory, or the phenomenal economic growth uh, which marked the Canadian wartime experience, that casually represents the unpleasant underside of the Allied successes on D-Day and during the Battle of Normandy. So before I get into this in detail, Don, do you want to introduce these? I know they were done in September, but do you want to talk about them for a moment? <clears throat> the absolute right off the top of my head, so don't anybody contradict me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know any of these people, I never did, uh, I'm way too young. Uh, this is Hugh Harvey. Hugh is a, a bombardier. A bombardier, for those of you who may not realize, it is the same rank as corporal for the, uh, for the privates and so or like the military infantry and stuff like that. So a bombardier is the same as a corporal. Uh, he was with the Royal Canadian Artillery, of course. And these are the ribbons that he earned. And if you want to know about them, uh, Abel Seaman Hike will, will entertain you. <laughs> There's um, there's a particular uh, medal on, on this, this one here, uh, which are, I would suggest is probably rare, and that is a welcome home um, to the veteran from Lakefield. Uh, they, there are very few towns that did that. Some gave out papers and things, but this particular one is, was given by the Lakefield, uh, uh, well, politicians, I guess. This, this fellow here is uh, Percival Payne. Percival Payne was, um, what do they call it, a sparker? Yeah. He, he was a wireless telegraph operator, which was lovingly called a sparker. Uh, and uh, again, I, I have very little I can tell you about this other than he was with the Navy. I don't know where he served. I, I should tell you that all of these people, plus a whole lot more, the documents have been ordered, like the military records. However, when you're dealing with the, uh, the National Archives in Ottawa and the uh, um, people that I just like a lot, I can't remember the call, um, takes months, like six months, to get records. Plus, they want you to pay for them. Uh, they had a, 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 an agreement that you could order what's called a genealogical package, like a, a month ago sort of thing. You wait six months, but you got them free. I guess somebody figured out that that was too good a deal, so they canceled the free bit. <laughs> so uh, the 300 and some close to 400 people that Neil and I have as a list to try to make our little project up on, will cost uh, like $10,000 to get the military records unless we find some way to do it. But we ordered one, one set of records as a matter of interest and there were 280-some pages. So multiply that by 40 cents or 30 cents at the best. So I'm sorry, we don't have much information on these people yet, but it's coming. First of all, uh, and I don't know if anybody knows this or not, but Romaine Shirley Millward was with the Women's Corps and she worked at Camp X, which was down Oshawa, Ajax Way, I think it was Boneville in that area. Very, very secret area, uh, which you've probably heard about many times. She 
was married to Percival. I just don't know if they were married before the service or after. And uh, unfortunately, I have no idea what happened to her. I know she has passed, but I don't know where she is, like where she's buried or whatever. If anybody does know, please tell me. And I will not waste any time talking about this fellow because everybody knows him more than I do. Right, Ted? <laughs> Mr. Moran, Moran, Moran? Moran. I'm used to the French Moran, but fantastic individual. There's one other that I'll mention. We don't have uh, one of these on. And he was in close to the same proximity as uh, Eddie. And his name is uh, Andrew Hogarth, who was from uh, Curd Lake. And Neil Lawson has done a tremendous amount of research on him. And shortly, I expect we'll have something there. But we do not have one of these on there. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> the D-Day landings are remembered in Canada because they've become a symbol of the Second War, and because so many people were involved in making the invasion possible. From the infantrymen at Bern, the infantrymen at Bernier Saint Sermer, to the welders of Montreal's Angus shops, to the thousands of farmhands across Canada's prairies, the merchant marine, and who could forget the 750,000 women who worked for war industries, freeing up men, uh, but also were making pretty good wages. A gal could uh, earn uh, $31 a week uh, building aircraft, which was pretty darn good right after the Depression. The collective memory of the Second War specifically is, is important because so, so many lives intersected. But I think uh, in, we can summarize it uh, as follows. The Second War lasted six terrible years and left a legacy of death and destruction. For a young uh, nation, it was a remarkable achievement. Serving in the Canadian Army, the Royal Canadian Navy, the Royal Canadian Air Force, and with other Allied forces, thousands of young Canadians fought from 1939 to 1945 in the battlefronts of the war, of the world. They brought honor and a new respect to this country. Most of all, they helped win the struggle against the tyranny and oppression which threatened to engulf the world. It was for our freedom that these young Canadians fought and it was for our freedom that many of them died. More than one million Canadians and Newfoundlanders served in the Second War. Of these, more than 45,000 gave their lives, and another 55,000 were wounded. Countless others shared in the suffering and hardships of war. And one final one, the Enigma Code, and I'm sure many of you have heard of it, this is a German code uh, which was extremely hard to break. They had many millions of options. And it gave, by cr cracking that code, the Allies were able to uh, uh, figure out the uh, German planning. And in order to do that, they had to invent and develop what we would call a computer today. They did that, and that was, the, they not only broke the code, but that was the beginning of the information generation and computers as we know them today. About half of the Army of Canada raised in World War II came from rural areas or small towns with a population under 4,000. The average age of recruits was slightly le uh, less than 20 years, although many of them lied about their age. In the very first year of the war, there was a great influx, un influx of older men in their mid-20s. They were, by and large, independent, independent folks who worked hard, played hard, and had a profound sense of fair play. They wanted to do their bit and lend a hand to those who had been crushed by the goose-stepping fanatics as shown on the newsreels. It must also be real, realized that jobs were scarce uh, following the Depression, and the dollar ten a day offered by the military along with medical, food, good boots was kind of a drawing card. They wondered just how serious a threat to democracy was that bombastic little German dictator with an army that marched funny but in late May and early June of 1940, the British Army narrowly escaped from Dunkirk, uh, leaving behind tens of thousands of stores and equipment and ammunition. Hitler was a serious problem. In Canada in June of 40, the pitifully understaffed, undertrained, and ill-equipped permanent force was augmented with anyone reasonably medically fit. Um, <clears throat> most of those had been serving with the non-permanent active militia. On 21 
uh, June 1940, the government authorized the National Resources Mobilization Act, giving the government the authority essentially to go out and get whoever they wanted. Many of these were used to replace casualties, and many simply transferred or volunteered for active service overseas. And on 18 May 1944, at East Grinstead in England, Prime Minister Mackenzie King was moved to tears upon reviewing a roll pass of hundreds of tanks. He said, and I quote, I, m I know most of these boys will never see their homes again. Later that month, the minister announced the 3rd Canadian Division would be uh, formed for overseas service and would be comprised of the 7th, 8th, and 9th Brigades, along with supporting troops such as artillery engineers and communications. The 9th had units including the Stormont, Dundas, and Glengarry Highlanders, as well as artillery armor and more, many from this area. And of course, the SDNGs were uh, uh, absorbed companies from the Princess of Wales Old Regiment and the Brockville Rifles. They completed basic training, joined their battalion. There were long route marches that toughened the feet. Stress was created and every effort was made to make the training uh, useful. Before long, they uh, started to gain confidence. They became a team. They knew that when the time came, they would be able to fight hard. They would need that in June of 44 when they landed on D-Day to face the 12th SS Panzer Division, a Hitler youth commanded by a devoted Nazi General Kurt Meyer, who would later stand on trial in front of his op opposite, Canadian General Harry Foster and others. Our guys would experience and come to learn about Pegasus Bridge, Juno Beach, Carpequet Air Force Field, Labby uh, Dardenne, and French towns such as Huron and Offie, among others. Later on, uh, they would carry the fight to, between the, the Dutch and, and uh, Belgium borders of the Scheldt and on into Kanaka Heist, and then into uh, Holland, <clears throat> excuse me. And by the way, on the 15th of August, 1944, the Lincoln and Wellens took part in a battle for the Fellies Gap. Hitler, Hitler would later say that 15 August was the worst day of his life. Operation Overlord, uh, uh, the D-Day invasion, um, Following the, uh, the upraid, uh, it was quickly ruled, uh, the idea of a frontal assault was quickly ruled out. And that was mainly because of the, uh, they figured that the requirements for a suitable landing field, um, or landing site, I should say, were for it to be within range of fighter aircraft based in southern England. To have at least one major port within easy reach, and I think many of you have read about it, uh, remember about the Mulberry Harbor that they built and floated over. It had to have adequate exits and backed by a good road network to have good defenses, good beach defenses capable of being suppressed by naval bombardment and bombing. And of course, as we all know, that didn't work all that well. Many of those uh, uh, defenses are still there today. With Allied air and sea superiority, things began to unfold in 5 June. Of 44, the German weather forecast, we just talk about weather forecasters today.